No, the premise for the book or premise for uh, this research is simply this, and I'll try to put it in as simple terms as possible so that you can, you know, you, you, you can later on uh, raise questions. If you look at Southeast Asian countries, and if you look at South Asian countries, you know, look at countries like Thailand, you look at countries like Myanmar, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and if you also look at countries like Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and so on, if you compare these two regions, Southeast Asia and South Asia, we find there are two things almost all the countries have in common. The first is that all the countries of these two regions are what we might call multi-ethnic. They don't have one nation, one ethnic group in that country. You know, the typical exam typical uh, model is that each country has a dominant majority, but then there are other minorities in each country. You know, you, in Thailand you have the same, Myanmar has the same, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, they all have a dominant group and surrounded by minorities. And South Asia is exactly like that. So this is a reality. This is a factual reality. So this is number one, that they're all multi-ethnic. And number two trend that we find is that over the last 50 to 60 years in all these countries, on the one hand, there has been a strong tendency to centralize power. You know, governments that has ruled these countries, they all tried to deal with their minority problem by creating strong central governments, very strongly centralized power. But you also find that partly because of that, perhaps, that in all, all these countries, there's a very strong resistance by certain minorities leading to ethnic conflict, secessionist movements, armed insurgency, and so on and so forth. So our starting point in the research was, how do we change these countries from highly centralized states that wants to dominate minorities or in some cases even assimilate minorities into the majority community. On the other hand, how do we convince minorities that secession is not the answer, separation is not the answer, conflict is not the answer. There has to be some sort of understanding and accommodation with the majority so that these countries can develop economically, they can become stable political democracies, they can become peaceful societies instead of seeing conflict and violence and so on and so forth. So this was basically the starting point of the research, that how do we change the picture from a negative picture to something of a positive picture. Now, it is in this context, it is in this debate that we raise the issue of what I call autonomy, or if I want to expand this concept, uh, I can even call it territorial autonomy. So the, so the question is, what, what really is autonomy? And why are we talking about autonomy as a sort of solution to this problem? Now, before we come to that, let me go back a little bit. And let me start by posing the question of what is the central attribute or central characteristic of a nation? How do we define a nation? Because realistically, you know, when I use the word multi-ethnic to describe the states in Southeast Asia and South Asia, we can easily describe them as not multi-ethnic only, but multinational. And in real sense, I think multinational is probably a better term rather than multi-ethnic. Yes, ethnicity is there, but ethnicity not just in its ethnic sense, but in a national sense. So what is the essence of being a nation? Or what is this national identity? A very standard definition of a nation is that it is a group of people who occupy a defined territorial homeland. So territory or land, a homeland, an idea of a homeland is very central to understandings of the nation. But in that traditional homeland, 
a territorial homeland. A nation is also defined by uh, common culture, uh, common tradition, a common language through which members of the group communicate with each other, uh, a common history. Sometimes this history is an imagined history in a lot of nations in lots of different parts of the world believe in a certain history and you may raise the question you know whether this is a factual history but then that is something that even historians often debate that you know what is really history history is what we come to actually believe so as a group of people we have a sense of history some groups even have a sense of common ancestry you know this is very common in a discussion of national identity for people to say oh but we came from this tribe you know 2000 years ago and this is our ancestor and from that we have come down today to this understanding of nation um, some authors would also suggest that one common attribute of nationhood is possibly religion nationhood is often anchored by some sort of common religious identity but the most important thing is that a nation becomes a nation when psychologically people who belong to that nation believe that we are part of that nation. So it is not just about objective things that you can go out and look and say, oh, this is culture is there or language is there. But it is also something up here. We believe that we are part of this nation. Uh, so it's a psychological thing that we belong to this nation and because we belong to this nation we share with everybody else within that nation ties of kinship, ties of common kinship. Now having said that, if you go back and look at the history of nations historically, not just in Southeast Asia or South Asia but across the world, then a common understanding among scholars is that for nations to really develop and really feel that their uh, national aspirations are somehow fulfilled, nations must have the political right in their defined territorial homeland. Some notion of political rights. And we can debate whether political rights might mean only sovereign rights or could it be something less than sovereignty we can debate that and that is why i think the question of autonomy is important but across the board if you sample various scholars and their writings on nat national question almost there's a consensus that for a nation to really become a nation and survive and develop you must have some notion of political rights in the territory that you call your national homeland so Territoriality is very important, culture is very important, uh, the psychology of being part of a nation is very important, and political rights are also very important. So this is the way we conceive of a nation. This notion that nations must have this political right in their territorial homeland to run their own affairs and so on and so forth, this concept actually developed from the French Revolution onwards, because the French Revolution talked about individual self-determination, that people have the democratic right to decide how they choose to live politically. In other words, we have the democratic right to choose our leaders and choose our own you know, different forms of government and decide on the powers that the government has uh, in order to rule and govern. So if this is a democratic right of every individual that the French Revolution talked about and events in Europe gra gradually moved towards you know, a, a greater sense of democracy and popular sovereignty from that time onwards. With the rise of the idea of, of nations, that groups of people must have their right in their territorial homeland, this idea of the nation and the idea of self-determination, if you put it together, then it creates the concept of the national self-determination. That nations have the democratic right, political right, to choose how they wish to live. And obviously the assumption here is no nation is going to willingly choose to live under somebody else's political control. So nations would exercise this right of national self-determination in order to create their own 
sovereign, independent political state under which that national group is going to thrive and prosper and develop and so on and so forth. Great, great concept in theory. In practice, enormously difficult to implement. And as a result, if you look at the practice of the UN since 1945, how did the UN look at this concept of national self-determination? The UN did not see it as a legal right. So the legality question was taken out of this discussion. UN looked at it as a political principle, that this is something in principle is OK, but of course, we'll have to look at it from the point of view of practicality every time. So not every nation is going to have its right to decide its own state. And you may ask, why not? Because we will end up with 5,000 microstates, which will be nonsensical. Secondly, even though I gave you a definition of the nation, could we all agree on who national groups would be? Uh, you know, if you give it to some group and say, well, others cannot have it, then the question will be, why can't they have it? Is the differentiation that clear cut? Everybody is going to put up their hand and say, we are a nation and we should therefore be independent. So you'll have you know, total chaos. And European leaders after the First World War, uh, you know the history that the First World War brought a uh, you know, a, a wave of democratization in Europe, creation of new states, and so on and so forth. The victorious powers who did that, uh, they did it roughly more as a principle rather than as a legal right, and they did it in a way that was, you know, as long as, that, as it was practical for them to do it. Um, so the UN practice clearly over the last 50, 60 odd years, has come down, UN has understood national self-determination really to mean several things. One, number one, decolonization. So when a colony of a European power chooses independence, it is supposed to be exercising its national self-determination. So that, that's number one. Number two, the UN argued that national self-determination could be used to give this right to territories that are under occupation. So for example, Palestine would be a great case. East Timor would, would be a great case because UN never really accepted East Timor's annexation by Indonesia. It always considered East Timor to be an occupied territory. Similarly, Palestine is considered an occupied territory. Therefore, if Palestine exercises this right of self-determination to become a separate country, separate state, that would be OK. And thirdly, the UN understood self-determination in order to mean bringing to an end institutionalized form of racism, especially in those cases where small minorities were ruling majorities. And the greatest example of that would be UN effort to bring up an end to the apartheid era in South Africa. So UN saw this as more a self-determination question. What the UN did not support was simply this. Let's say a country like India, which is heavily multinational, you know, not one group, many groups. You might even call India the last surviving empire, you know, because it's so big and it has got so many different groups. India exercised its national self-determination rights to become independent in 1947, independent from British rule. But then what about nations within India? What about nations like the Bengalis, the Assamese, the Kashmiris, the Marathis, the Punjabis, and so on and so forth? Do they have the right to then stand up and say, we are a nation and we therefore should have the right of self-determination? Under the UN, no. You don't have the right. Colonies can exercise it. Once it is exercised, that's done, finished. Occupied territories like East Timor or Palestine can do it. Once it's done, that's finished. And if you have a situation of institutionalized racism like South Africa had, once that's done, that's finished, no more. So in effect, what the UN was trying to do is, UN realized that raising this question of national self-determination to its logical conclusion would be like opening a Pandora's box. You know, 
this is a, this is a box or let's say a bottle you know you have put a genie inside the bottle a, a ghost inside the bottle and the bottle is tightly capped once you remove the cap and the ghost comes out no you don't know what's going to happen you know you will end up dividing the world into so many tiny pieces that it will be ungovernable it will be unmanageable and you and practice obviously didn't then support that now why is this important it is important because states in southeast asia and south asia since 1945 and more in an era of decolonization they also realized that they are sitting with a pandora's box you know indian government realized and this was a big debate right after independence when the indian constitution was being discussed and drafted the indian government's argument was we must have a strongly centralized government you know with a lot of power at the center because if we don't do it india will div get divided into tiny tiny countries and we can't do that we can't allow that the mindset was very similar in indonesia the mindset very similar in thailand mindset very similar in other countries in pakistan we must have strong centralized government because without that we cannot create a national unity we can't keep our territorial integrity together we have different national groups in our country some of them don't want to be here i mean in india's case i can tell you india northeast was always in revolt from 1947 onwards and it took india almost 30 40 years to even come to terms with the revolts in the northeast and even then they didn't do it very well even some insurgency is always going on in the indian northeast pakistan had the same problem they thought that islam is going to be the glue they're going to have a strong state you know state is going to promote islam and so on and so forth and that's going to bring everybody together it didn't happen you know 1971 east pakistan broke away from west pakistan and bangladesh was born but then did bangladesh solve the national question no because in hill tracks of bangladesh there are tribal people who don't want to be part of bangladesh or <coughs> at the very least you know they want substantial autonomy in their region so that they can have freedom to run their own affairs in the way they want to see it sri lanka same case you know highly centralized state and ended up with major ethnic problem in the form of a tamil insurgency which ran for 30 odd years and then very brutally finished uh in 2009 uh when the sri lankan government said you know we will militarily finish the ltt uh and, and that's how it turned out so uh, through this exercise you can see you know this constant struggle between states which are highly centralized wants to monopolize power wants to smash every minority into submission you know either you don't open your mouth don't create problem or join the majority you know don't forget that there always this assimilation is pressure in india we saw an attempt to assimilate when in the 1950s the central government tried to introduce the language hindi to all over india and southern india said sorry i'm not learning hindi this is not my language this is a language spoken in northern india we will not accept hindi and the south revolted eastern india also revolted i mean i remember my parents you know i'm ethnically a bengali in the 1970s you know when i was slightly politically conscious i remember debates at home that uh, we should not learn hindi you know the government attempt to force hindi on everyone should be resisted we are bengalis we should only speak bengali uh, so those debates emerged and states tried to either assimilate or they tried to and and high and high late minorities by by beating minorities into submission but they were aware of the problem so the real problem is this if you look at southeast asia and south asia you will find that some of the fiercest conflicts in this two regions have involved states who are determined to defend their territorial integrity and sovereignty at any cost and non state ethnic nations who are equally determined to exercise their right of national self determination and exercising that right to separate from the state and become an independent entity so these two pull in different directions the states want to preserve their territorial sovereignty territorial integrity and disgruntled ethnic nations they are equally determined 
that we want to exercise our national self-determination rights, we want to separate and become an independent state. So in, in a sense, you might say that this is a form of a zero-sum conflict. Either the state win and the ethnic minority loses everything, or the minority is successful and the state loses its territory. Now if you think of the last 50 odd years, how many successful secessions can you think of in Southeast Asia and South Asia? In South Asia, uh, Bangladesh's secession, Bangladesh's separation from Pakistan in 1971 was a successful one. So Pakistan lost a huge part of its territory. Bangladesh was created. But Bangladesh is an odd example because in the, in the creation of Bangladesh, India played a very decisive role. India actually went to war against Pakistan in order to free Bangladesh and, and create Bangladesh. And very few cases are there where a country has actually gone to war in order to help uh, ethnic minority. But in this case, India did, perhaps because it was against Pakistan, with whom India has fierce rivalry. But in Southeast Asia, the only successful case uh, I can think of is the secession of Singapore from Malaysia, but that was by mutual consent to some extent. If you think of East Timor, then East Timor is not really a secession because the UN never really accepted East Timor's annexation by Indonesia. So when Indonesia allowed referendum to take place in East Timor, the UN saw this more as a kind of decolonization almost, you know, freeing East Timor from foreign occupation. Uh, foreign control rather than secession of a part of a country from the rest of the country. Now, Indonesia's biggest challenge in that sense came from Aceh, where you know there was a very strong movement to separate from Indonesia, but we'll talk about Aceh later on. There's a chapter in this book on, on Aceh. Um, so not too many successful cases of secession in, in world politics, really. So what happens? in that sense is that in this conflict between states and ethnic minority nations, the states have pretty much won in most of the cases. But they have won at a major price. And today we often debate the situation in Sri Lanka because the price that Sri Lanka was willing to pay, massive destruction, massive humanitarian crises. You know, yes, they destroyed the LTTE, they destroyed the Tamil Tigers, but they also killed a lot of innocent you know, civilians in the process of doing that. Uh, we talk about Kashmir in the context of discussing India. At the height of India's counterinsurgency operation in Kashmir, there were something close to 600,000 Indian soldiers uh, in that region. And even today, the big point of discussion in India, and there's a big article in today's uh, Times of India on that, is the continuation of almost absolute powers given to the Indian military. This is called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. The army can do anything it wants, no one can question. No prosecution, no complaint in any court. Uh, nothing will happen to the soldiers you know, who, who do this. Uh, and it's a very draconian measure that India has enacted to give the armed forces almost unlimited power to go and solve the insurgency by force uh, required. So the question that we asked in this book is, does the equation between ethnic nations and states always have to be zero sum? Is there some concept out there that we can use to convert this relationship from a negative one to a positive one? And what is the real challenge? The real challenge is that we have to convince the states that they're not going to disintegrate. Because states don't like to disintegrate. States don't like to lose territory. So if you convince the states, look, there is a solution out there which if you accept, you will continue to remain the way you are. You will continue to exercise sovereignty the way you are. Your territorial integrity will remain intact. On the other hand, we have to convince ethnic minority nations that you must understand national self-determination in your ethnic homeland in a slightly different way. This political right that you are talking about, and which I referred to earlier, does not have to be sovereignty, does not have to be statehood. It can be 
something called autonomy. And self-determination can be understood both in an external sense. If you understand self-determination in an external sense, then you would probably have to say that national self-determination means sovereignty, it means independence. And that's the problem, because the moment you say that, the states are going to say, oh, they're trying to separate. We can't allow that. And there'll be conflict. But what if you understand national self-determination in an internal sense, saying, we are not trying to break away from this state. We'll still be a part of it, but we will have a greater political rights and freedom in our designated territorial homeland. So in that sense, you could see or you could argue that self-determination can be an internal self-determination. Now, the person who actually talked about this in a, in, a, in a major sense, in a policy sense, was the, ironically, the ideologue of the Tamil Tigers, you know, the LTTE. Uh, Anton Balasingham, who, who died, uh, I think he had uh, cancer and he had uh, acute diabetes. Uh, he passed away before the LTTE was actually destroyed. Anton Balasingham, in an interview in the early 2000, 2002, I think, made it very clear when discussions were going on between the LTT and the Sri Lankan government. And they were talking about creating some sort of a federal polity, which, which didn't go anywhere in the end, by the way. But they were talking about creating a federal polity. They were talking about giving the Sri Lankan Tamils a kind of autonomy package in the north and eastern province of Sri Lanka, where Tamils are located. And Balasingham said, and I, and I, and I quote you this line, with this passage, which I think is very interesting. Balasingham talked about his understanding and the Tamil Tiger's understanding of national self-determination. And I quote, we mean the right of people to decide their own political destiny. It can also apply to autonomy and self-governance. If autonomy and self-governance is given to our people, we can say that internal self-determination is to some extent met. But if the Sri Lankan government rejects our demand for autonomy and self-governance and continues with repression, then as a last resort, we will opt for secession and independence. That also comes under self-determination. So national self-determination, according to Balasingham, can be understood both internal autonomy, self-governance type of sense, or external sovereignty, independence, secession type of sense. Now, the choice, he was saying, choice is really the Sri Lankan governments. You keep on repressing us, keep on denying us rights, keep refusing to accept our territorial homeland, then we will think about insurgency, armed violence, leading to separation, independence, sovereignty, a new Tamil state. But if you allow us self-governance and autonomy, then we will drop the demand for separation and independence. We will have autonomy and self-governance, and that will be internal self-determination. We'll be happy with that. So which way do you want to go? Now, what then are the basic parameters of an autonomy package? You know, What is it about autonomy that we're talking about? And I list to you six things that I think are central to the understanding of this territorial autonomy. Number one, territorial demarcation of ethnic homeland. As I said to you that ethnic nations have a very strong identity with a particular territory, which they consider to be their ancestral homeland. You need to accept that. You need to say, OK, we'll accept your concept of homeland, but then where are the borders? Let's talk about the borders of this homeland. So we can negotiate the borders. You know That has to be demarcated. Number two, you've got to sort out the kind of regional institutions that will be created to govern that homeland and the kind of legislative, executive, and judicial functions and powers that these institutions would have. And one of the key uh, models of power sharing between a central government at the top but regional governments is the concept of federalism. So a lot of autonomy discussion also centers on the question of federalism. Division of powers between center and province, uh, 
you know, who's, who has got what rights and so on and so forth. So division of powers would be the sort of third criteria, that you know, powers must be divided between center and the region. Fourth, the regions and the regional institutions of governance must have a high degree of fiscal autonomy because often government is about revenue, raising money to govern. Now you may have a great autonomy arrangement, but if the regional institutions lack the power to raise revenue, then that might become a problem which will lead to the failure of autonom autonomous arrangement. So degree of fiscal autonomy for regional institutions. You must develop some form of arbitration mechanism in case disputes emerge between the central government and the regional government, how will disputes be resolved? So some mechanisms to arbitrate. And then finally, some critics argue that regional bodies must, given, must be given a representation at the national level in the center government so that on policies that are being made at a national level, the regions can have a say, the provinces can have a say. Now, the best way to understand this is to look at the American Constitution. You know, in the American Constitution, you have a federal form of government. So there's a national government, and then there are state governments. America has got 50 states, each with a government. So powers are divided between center and states. Secondly, within the national government, there are very clearly division of powers between the presidency, which is the executive branch of the government, the legislature, which is the Congress, and the judiciary, which is the Supreme Court of the United States. So judicial powers with the Supreme Court, Congress has got legislative powers, they can make laws, and the presidency has to run the government and implement those laws. And within the legislature, if you look at it, you've got two chambers. America has got a bicameral parliament, two chambers. The people directly are represented in the lower chamber, which is called the House of Representatives and it is based on number of people that live in a certain state. So states that are more populous have more representatives. States that have less people have less representatives. And then you have the upper chamber, which is known as the Senate. And the Senate represents this last point. Irrespective of size, irrespective of population, the states are equally represented in the Senate. So Senate has a total number of 100 senators. 50 states, each state has got two senators. And these senators represent not just the people, but they represent the region, the state that, you know, that they come from. And in that sense, you could argue that when national laws are made or national decisions are made, you know, Senate has got a big role to play in uh, signing of foreign, uh, you know, foreign agreements, foreign treaties, and so on and so forth, appointments of judges, etc that when the senators vote, they vote keeping in mind the interest of the region, the state that they represent. So some sort of regional representation at the national level uh, or national level policy and national level discussion. So this is you know, basically what I think people who support this idea of territorial autonomy argue. And their argument is that once you do that, you are able to allow an ethnic minority nation to exercise its right of self-determination on the one hand, but on the other hand, you give the state the confidence that it is not going to break up, that this is not going to lead to secession or independence of a part of the state. Okay, one final point which I would like to make and then I'll stop is that even if you have the best intentions, you know, the state has the best intention to go for autonomy, the minority, nation also has the best intention. There are some serious practical difficulties associated with the concept which we should be aware of. And it is these difficulties which often lead to the failure of autonomy arrangements. And the difficulties, like, difficulties are like this. Some scholars have argued that it is almost impossible to find the right balance between the division of powers and functions. Now the problem is this, if the state gives too much power of function to the region, to the minorities, then there could be a danger that they will use this autonomy to learn the ropes of governance. They will become more ambitious and then today's autonomy may turn into tomorrow's independence movements. And a lot of states are fearful of this, which is why they don't want to give powers.
that they will get the powers today and then tomorrow they'll demand more and then next day they'll demand even more and eventually this will end up with separation with independence and so on but the reverse is also true if you give less very little powers are actually given to the regions then the regions are not going to be satisfied the ethnic minority nation will not be satisfied there will be serious factions within the minority nations on the question of autonomy let's say the group that negotiates the autonomy opposing groups will come up and say what actually have you received you have not received anything so we are rejecting this and we are going back to the days of insurgency so finding that balance that what will keep the region and the ethnic minority happy and what will also give the state confidence is a very delicate balance in practice it is almost impossible to do and uh, the great example of this was again in the case of sri lanka in 2002 when they were seriously negotiating uh, a federal kind of uh, polity where regions will have substantial autonomy the government that was negotiating this the vikrama singh government belonging to the united national party uh, there was a national election and the opposition basically said to the sri lankan people look this government is giving far too much to the minorities and the government lost the opposition won the election they came to power and the very first thing they did was to start taking away those those powers and of course the tamil tigers said look you know you're not giving us autonomy previous government was giving now you're taking back so we go back to the days of war so both sides decide that war is the ultimately the solution but when the tigers had autonomy when they were negotiating autonomy with the vikramasinghe government there were reports that they were using that in order to put in place what could only be thought of as trappings of a new state you know they created a tamil police force they created they were raising the tamil flag uh, on the state capital all of this unnerved the sri lankan government saying oh we are giving them autonomy and maybe they are using it now to start a movement gradual movement towards separation and independence maybe we should back off and this is the fear that the opposition parties used against the government so this is a very delicate problem you know how do you divide second problem uh, or difficulty according to some scholars is that there is no a priori logic that autonomy by itself will solve everything because their argument is that in a sense when we have ethnic conflict or ethnic violence it is basically a governance problem and the governance problem is that we have failed to come up with creative ideas by which we can satisfactorily govern ethnic minorities how do we govern minorities because we have failed which is why we have a problem now what autonomy would do according to these critics is simply trans transform bad governance from one setup to another setup so just because now minority leaders are going to run the affairs of their region does not necessarily mean that they will run it well or they will run it efficiently or they will be less corrupt compared to the people who ran the government from the center and this was a problem that if you read the book uh, the chapter on ache um, marcus meitner talks about that the gam leaders who were given the power by the sri lanka uh, by the indonesian government people suddenly saw within a few years that the gam leaders were now driving around in mercedes cars you know they were building palatial houses so the question was where are you getting the money from is this development money that you are diverting into your own pocket now that you have got power the government has given you autonomy so the people who are exercising the autonomy whether they are central elites or whether they are regional elites there's no logical reason just because you transfer power from the center to the region that you will suddenly get better governance and if you if you accept the premise that the problem is really the governance you know problem is the corruption problem is the waste problem is the high handed manner that government often deals with people then changing master may not change those problems what you need is enlightened people to govern and govern with a degree of respect give people a sense of 
fairness and a sense of justice and so on and so forth. And that may not come with autonomy. And if it doesn't come with autonomy, for example, if GAM fails to use this opportunity in Aceh, people of Aceh will throw out GAM and some other groups will come up and they will say, we are going back to the days of our insurgency struggle against Indonesia. And they'll start blaming Indonesia for not controlling GAM and the, and the waste and corruption of GAM. And I found very similar things in my own research on, um, uh, on, on a particular area of India, uh, which is in the northern part of West Bengal state, uh, a place called Darjeeling, where in the 1980s there was a massive demonstration. Uh, the Gorkha people of Darjeeling wanted to create a separate state, not leave India. They are part of West Bengal. They said, we don't want to be part of West Bengal. We want a separate province to be created called Gorkha land, where we will be in charge of our area and we will govern. So the Indian government said, no, you can't really have a state called Gorkha land, but what I'll do is I'll give you substantial autonomy. And they created something called the Gorkha Hill Council. And they put the leader of the main political front in, in Darjeeling as the leader of this Hill Council. Guess what? In 10 years of rule, this guy never submitted accounts even once. And he is considered to be one of the richest person in Darjeeling. So people say that almost the entire development assistance that the center gave to, you know, for the development of Darjeeling went into his pockets and his friends in the movement. Things came to such a pass that in mid-2000, he was physically thrown out of Darjeeling by his own people who created a separate organization and they made it clear to him that if he dared to come back into that region, he would be gunned down. He will be killed. He was, he was so unpopular by that time. And this new group which came to power, they then wanted again uh, more autonomy and a, another round of discussion, which they have now got. They have got even substantial autonomy from the center. And it will be a big question to see how these people now govern. So, Darjeeling's problem, if you go back and say, oh, there were problems of development, problems of neglect, you know, they were treated poorly in the 60s, 70s, 80s, which led to the movement. You go to Darjeeling today, you see the same thing is still there. You know, and they, for the last 15 years, had their own governance, own council, and they did nothing. So, oftentimes, you might find change of masters does not improve change of governance. Thirdly, some people argue that if you have a conflict, like you are having in Thailand right now, you know, between the state and a minority in southern Thailand, or Sri Lanka had, and this conflict was a very vicious conflict, people were dying, etc., etc. In that sort of an atmosphere, if you are going to talk about trying to create an autonomy package, uh, you've got to make certain big decisions, certain big concessions, you know, both in the division of powers and functions, creation of institutions, and so on and so forth. And the minority also has to make big decisions that we are going to lay down our arms, we're going to surrender arms to the, to the state, uh, we will decommission our soldiers, and so on and so forth. All of this in the middle of conflict is very difficult to do, because who is going to start the process? You know, who, can you trust the other side? That will be the big question. You know, people are dying, bullets are flying, how do you go about discussing this? So what you need is some temporary halt to the fighting, you know, some sort of a ceasefire for a, for a time period, which will prevent the violence from actually happening. Now, when you say that, then you have a slightly different problem because we argue that uh, groups don't fight unless they are sure that they're going to gain something more by fighting than they will get by not fighting, okay? So to have a ceasefire between two sides who have still not given up the notion of fighting and getting more, you need somebody from outside, a third person to come and say, look boys, you know, you are fighting and I don't like it, you got to stop. Now, without that third person coming in and imposing that ceasefire between two groups who are still convinced that they need to fight on, it's very difficult to stop the fighting. And unless you can stop the fighting, how can you even seriously discuss 
questions of autonomy, questions of power sharing, and so on. And last but not least is the problem of a spoiler. And the spoiler problem is simply this. If you have, and this is more on the side of the, the minority, less probably on the side of the state, but it can happen on the side of the state as well. Let's say India wants to talk autonomy with the Kashmiri insurgents. Okay, let's say hypothetically Indian government is serious about discussing autonomy. The first problem is, which Kashmiri groups are you going to talk to? Who is the real representative of the Kashmiri opinion? Because there are 50 groups who will put their hand and say, I'm the real representative, you cannot talk to anybody else. And there will be an in intra-group fighting, inter-group fighting that will develop because each group will say, I'm the representative, so who do you talk to is the first problem. The second problem is, from the state side, how do you neutralize those who are going to oppose any move towards autonomy? And this was a failure of the Vikramasinghe gov government in Sri Lanka. Vikramasinghe was very serious about you know, some discussion of peace with the LTTA. His real problem was he could not convince the opposition parties in his own parliament. And the opposition parties at every point created problems for him. And being a politician, leader of a government, he realized that if he went too far, he will be thrown out because I won't have power anymore. So if I don't have power anymore, what can I do? I can't do anything. So if today the Indian government, led by the Congress party, wants to decide to give autonomy to people in Kashmir, the first problem it will face is who should I discuss this with? And if I discuss this with group A, then group B is going to create trouble. And that would be the end of the autonomy discussion. And more importantly, how do I keep my opposition parties in the Indian national parliament from spoiling this? Because those opposition parties will start a national campaign. They will start accusing the government of selling out. They will convince the people that you should not vote for this government in the next election. There's an election coming in 2014. Government might say, look, until 2014 election, I can't do anything. Because if I start this now, I'll surely lose that election because the opposition parties will make us look bad. And politics will come in. So this problem of spoiler, you know, both from your own national opposition and factions within you know, the, the insurgents, uh, is a big problem when you're trying to discuss autonomy. I want to end on uh, this note, but I will also say that uh, there are separate chapters in this book, you know, one on this Kashmir problem between India and Kashmir, uh, the Sri Lankan case, you know, the Tamils and Sri Lankan government. There's another chapter on India's approach to the northeastern insurgency, especially in Assam. And then we have a chapter on Indonesia and Aceh. We have a chapter on Philippines and Mindanao. And our Professor Chaiwat has written a chapter on the southern Thailand violence in this book. Uh, the question of autonomy, as all of you probably know, has suddenly gained uh, limelight today because in Philippines they have had a major announcement that the government of Philippines and the uh, Muslim uh, Liberation Front, you know, MILF, uh, Muslim, uh, I'm sorry, Mindanao Islamic uh, Liberation Front, uh, they have entered into an agreement not on uh, you know, a, a package of autonomy, but they have basically agreed to a framework which says that we will create a separate Bongso Moro uh, region, clearly identified region, which will be the Muslim homeland in Philippines. We will divide powers between the central government and the regional area. And we will not put a timeline in this idea. It will be a process through which we will go and no matter how long it takes, five years, 10 years, doesn't matter. But our aim would be eventually to create regional institutions, clearly identified region, territorially, and clear division of powers between center and province so that peace can return in Mindanao. Very lofty ambition. Uh, I wish them all the best. But uh, you know, if you go by history, then Mindanao has had a long history in the Philippines of autonomy discussions ultimately leading to failure. So with that I end, I'm, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but the conclusion of the book was that uh, 
Ache by far was the only example where uh, autonomy arrangements uh, have a decent chance of actually working. Uh, if, if a lot of things go uh, in a way that, that, that we think it can go. Uh, but the rest of the authors were quite pessimistic about autonomy working in India or Thailand or uh, Philippines and so on. But we can debate that. What if there is like uh, the neighbor or the other nations want to influence in that particular ethnic so to rebellate themselves so is that autonomous is still useful for it i you know i don't know i'm not fully understanding the question but are you suggesting that if a neighboring country is yes, creating the trouble is creating trouble it becomes difficult because then you know you will start doubting the intentions of the group uh, as to why they are creating trouble are they creating trouble because there are some serious problems that needs to be solved, that needs to be addressed, or are they dancing to the tune of somebody else? And you know, when when the hand of a neighboring country is very prominently, you know, seen in in many conflicts, uh, the central government will become more resistant, and you know, it's, it's hard to then break the cycle of violence. In, in, in those cases um, and and you know discussing serious autonomy for those sort of problems I think is more problematic because of the fear that if you give them autonomy then maybe in two years time or three years time they will use that opportunity and then suddenly declare independence and then you'll have a bigger problem so I think you know the fear factor from the point of view of the state rises more if a neighboring you know enemy is involved in all in almost all cases you can see that and it becomes the picture becomes much more complicated